Okay, I think we can start. Hi, hi, I'm Vivien Barnier, and this is Martin Jäger. Um, we will talk about power to the people, a technology for energy access, or access to energy. We have seen a lot of great presentation uh, today, very technical, very detailed. This presentation will start slightly differently. It goes also like this general discussion we had shortly about community. Um, and how to grow the community for energy projects. And I want particularly to talk to you guys about access to energy and how we can use open source and which potential open source has for this completely underexplored area for open source because a lot of these great projects are particularly targeting industrialized geographies, let's say, and their realities. But there's also another reality which looks... Oh, like that? Yes. <laughs> um, as you can see, so in the north and hemisphere, like the global north, a lot of lights in the night. While you see there's a lot of people living here and here and also here, but there's much less light. That's because there is no electricity. So if it's the energy dev room, we should also think about how to leverage open source both software, hardware, and community to help electrify these areas. Um, and if we look particularly on how electrification has gone in the like, recent years, you can see there's been some progress in reducing people without electricity. So we started in over a billion in 2012. But then in the recent years, like this improvement of access to electricity stopped, and we have even like a back trend. Any idea why? Not exactly. Not only, I mean, Bangladesh as well, and also on the African continent, there's a bit of progress, but. It, it got, yeah, but, and now we are kind of, now it's not getting cheaper anymore? Population uh, growth in areas without electricity. Exactly, uh, general population growth. So, I mean, the speed of electrification is the same, just the population growth has, like, outpaced the speed we are electrifying. So, we have now every year more people with our electricity than less. Um, yeah, so we need to speed up the process of electrification in general. Um, now, electrification of areas which haven't been electrified in the past brings particular challenges, um, which is you have extremely low income customers, you have extremely remote areas, and don't think about what is remote here in Belgium or in Europe or somewhere, it's completely different. Um, you have unknown future demand patterns, and forget about AI, machine learning, it's just not going to work, you don't have data. It's people that never used electricity, so you have no clue and you can't use these like digitalized methods to for predict like what will be the demand. Um, data connectivity issues, so if you want to communicate with the assets, um, extreme weather conditions, and regulatory uncertainty, because a lot of countries which are not that stable in the political situation, so you also don't know if they're coming the main good, if they're not coming the main good, what technology will I need, and so on. So you need extremely low resilient technology to achieve universal access to energy, because you have to respond to all these particular challenges. And now you have NGOs, you have private companies, you have international companies, international large utilities are trying to go into this market, non-profits, cooperatives, communities, even agribusinesses, because they are already present in these areas, often are going into energy ventures. And all these companies or stakeholders or NGOs are developing technology, software, hardware, and also business models. And very often they come up with exactly the same thing, or almost the same thing. So they're constantly reinventing the wheel. Because it's a very nascent sector with a lot of players. So perfect playground for open source, I would say, because we have to overcome this constant reinvention of the wheel. And it's nascent, so there's a lot of possibilities to still shape the sector, which in the industrialized countries often is a bit more tricky because they're more established industries, more established players, bigger players, and so on. 
Um, so what we do at Nexus is we promote and support open source development and adoption for NGX, very particularly for technologies that are meant to provide electricity to people who have not been electrified in the past, particularly to, pro to generate an equitable ecosystem where more local companies, particularly like domestic companies, can participate and can compete against like large utilities like the ANGs of this world or so on, like trying to, to grab these markets. Um, and to have this adaptable and resilient infrastructure that we need to electrify. And to say what that means, a couple of uh, projects that we have funded and supported the development in the past, they, they range from software, hardware, and business models. I will not go into details for the sake of time. And we want to speak particularly about one in particular today, which is an open hardware project, which is the uh, open source battery management system, or the Libre Solar BMS C1, which has been developed uh, by Libre Solar, and which Martin will now provide you more insights on. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm from Libre Solar, which is uh, yeah, mostly an open source hardware and firmware uh, project, uh, but we're also a very small company uh, and uh, doing some consultancy work around the um, open source hardware development. And uh, yeah, we've developed these battery management systems uh, with a particular focus on energy access uh, in a project together with the Inexcess Foundation. And I will yeah, explain a little bit uh, what a battery management system is at the very beginning and uh, yeah, talk about some of the technical aspects as well as the community and how we are interacting with other people interested to uh, yeah, join our movement, so to say. Yeah, a battery management system is uh, yeah, part of almost any modern uh, electrical equipment that's battery powered because all those batteries, those systems use uh, lithium ion batteries. And uh, yeah, in the energy sector, energy access sector in the past, uh, there was still a huge use of lead acid batteries, which have some issues with environmental, uh, environmental damages and uh, which also don't last that long. And nowadays, uh, lithium ion batteries are getting cheaper, and so also. You want uh, to raise your hand, maybe, just uh, not, like not the mic, but your hand on the mic. It's very ah. you be holding it wrong. Okay. <laughs> so I covered the antenna, apparently. Uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, nowadays uh, also in the energy access sector, which is very cost sensitive, as you can imagine, uh, we're also yeah, using lithium ion batteries more and more. And so we need a battery management system that takes care of the safety of those uh, battery systems. So that's basically what it does. We have a pack of uh, lots of different uh, uh, cells switched in series, connected in series. Uh, we measure each single cell voltage, make sure that they are well balanced. We measure the current, and if something goes wrong, we have the safety measures like a fuse and a switch, uh, which open the battery, and so that uh, yeah, you don't get an overheating battery that could potentially even explode. And uh, of course, it's a safety critical component, so you have to take care to to develop it right. And uh, yeah, open source is a really good method uh, for collaborating and uh, yeah, not reinventing this wheel, which could be a costly process. So, um, yeah, this is the, the uh, hardware board that we developed. It can be divided into two parts largely. This is the, the power part, which does the switching and the current measurement. And you see those pretty large connectors. Uh, we can handle up to 100 amps, uh, which is not that common for uh, most people used to Arduino and so on. Of course, for the own tech guys who had the presentation before, it's also going in that direction. Um, yeah, and that's a little bit challenging to put the microcontroller and the uh, power parts onto the same PCB, but we decided to go with that route because, uh, yeah, we really have to make it uh, cheap, as cheap as possible, but still uh, yeah, handle this amount of power. Um, yeah, and with these 100 amps and up to 48 volts, you can uh, yeah, provide one uh, huge in that sector, uh, AC inverter with enough electricity, like f three, four, five kilowatts almost, and uh, that's sufficient to build a small AC mini grid in such an area. 
there are also so-called solar home systems, which are really tiny, like 150 watts, well, no, 50 to 150 watts, so really uh, tiny systems. This BMS is not targeted at those systems, but more at the slightly larger systems. But you can also use the technology for um, light electric vehicles um, and other things, uh, especially because the firmware is uh, yeah, open and uh, can be adapted easily. Uh, for in terms of communications, we have uh, the CAN bus, which is the automotive and industrial uh, state-of-the-art protocol for used for uh, batteries as well. Um, yeah, uh, but we also have Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth low energy, so that would be more for the non-control part. So we can talk to inverters, for example, with the CAN bus, but you can also have a smart smartphone app and connect to your battery. Um, yeah. Where's the, where, where's the antenna? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, for an open source product, we think it's also essential to use only open source tools, and so that's why we decided to go with uh, KiCad, obviously. And yeah, uh, so since a few years, I think KiCad is really a completely professional, great uh, PCB uh, design software. And it has very nice plugins which you can use uh, to automate some processes. And we're always trying to uh, yeah, somehow get to, uh, towards a similar experience than you have with software development for the hardware development. Because if you get a pull request and you get a, a binary, uh, and then you try to understand yeah, what's happening, what did the person change. Uh, that's difficult, so uh, we use some uh, community-developed tools uh, to create uh, diffs uh, in PDF format, so you can uh, see what the pull request changes, and that makes it yeah, easier to collaborate also on hardware development, even though it's still not as easy as with software. Um, yeah, also, we generate an interactive HTML bill of materials where you can see the, all the part placements. So if you want to um, assemble it manually or if you want to fix something, then it makes it easier to understand and find the parts. Yeah, all those are community-developed plugins. Uh, and for the firmware side, the software that's running on the BMS, uh, we are using the Zephyr uh, real-time operating system. And I can really recommend anyone who's uh, into embedded uh, development and maybe didn't uh, use RTOSs before, really try it out. Uh, it's maintained by the Linux Foundation, so really fully open source. And it has r extremely great features, uh, so you can use it for almost any architecture. And uh, you can also switch uh, between different uh, microcontrollers because it's ver very well abstracted. And that's uh, something we experienced during our development. So we started with an STM32 microcontroller. And then a uh, chip crisis came, and we couldn't get any uh, STM32 microcontrollers anymore. So we thought, hmm, what are we going to do? And we uh, uh, yeah, replaced the microcontroller with uh, an ESP32 uh, C3 microcontroller and it was really just a matter of changing a few board configuration files and then all the things like UART communications and so on worked out of the box almost out of the box I have to say because there were some bugs in some drivers which we of course upstreamed and fixed uh, but this is now uh, no fixed yeah, because that uh, microcontroller was still pretty young but uh, yeah, that's really a huge advantage. And so if someone comes and needs this battery management system but needs a different communication protocol or slightly different hardware configuration or a different microcontroller for whatever reason, it's uh, almost a matter of a day to get it ported to a different board. Yeah, as mentioned already, we have lots of communication uh, stacks in Zephyr already working out of the box. Uh, for this uh, energy access market, the GSM communication is very important because uh, most of those uh, batteries or off-grid systems need remote communication through GSM. Uh, but we can also use Bluetooth Low Energy and CAN and Modbus uh, for the more local communication. Uh, yeah, there are also some uh, Zephyr folks here at FOSDEM. Uh, we don't have a dedicated dev room, but uh, yeah, so if you want to learn more about Zephyr, I'm also an active contributor and maintainer. Uh, just let me know afterwards and then we can talk about it a bit more. Uh, for the communications, uh, we are using a, a protocol 
so to say, uh, that's called ThinkSet, which you can think of as an API, a REST API, but for microcontrollers. So you can use it over the serial interface, you can use it over WebSocket remotely, you can use it uh, over CAN bus, over Bluetooth Low Energy. We are using exactly the same uh, upper layer of the communication protocol uh, for all these layers, uh, which makes it really easy to integrate it also into other projects. Uh, it's not uh, meant to be just for battery management systems, and it's self-explanatory. Self so you can see an example here. You can send a request, this would, uh, request uh, the battery parts uh, from the uh, from the battery uh, with, the, with the question mark for a get request and then you get the data as JSON including the units and whether they are read only or write only uh, values and so on and it's uh, yeah quite versatile and uh, we are making good experiences with that in case you're interested here are the links uh, the presentation is also uploaded online by the way uh, now coming to one challenging part of open source hardware development, which is the manufacturing or production. Uh, so yeah, often you can order uh, electronics hardware on JLC PCB, but for these power electronics board it's a bit more difficult. Sometimes you don't get the board specifications you need uh, because you need thicker copper layers than with uh, boards where you just send out some data or communicate on the, uh, on the PCB. And uh, also we have some quite heavy connectors on the boards which need special soldering processes and so on. So, uh, so far we haven't uh, ordered anything in with the Chinese manufacturers yet, but uh, mainly uh, yeah, ordered boards uh, in locally in Germany. Uh, and we're in contact with some companies in Nigeria who are also trying to produce it or yeah, they, they will be able to produce it in the future so that it's... Uh, yeah, we want to basically also break this chain of uh, developing something in Europe, producing it in China and shipping it to Africa. Uh, so, yeah, the, the idea is that it can be produced locally. And uh, thanks uh, to these uh, features in KiCad, you can also even easily, kind of easily, solder it by hand. So this is an image of uh, the first prototype in our fab lab in Hamburg, where we have a manual pick and place machine, but you can also use tweezers. And you need a pizza oven uh, and reflow uh, or a small reflow oven, and then you can do it yourself. Uh, that being said, we are currently we have ordered some PCBs. If you want to participate in the project, they will be ready soonish in one month, maybe. And uh, yeah, you can also get in contact with us. Our plan is, of course, in the future to be able to provide uh, boards for. Yeah, easily and for low price uh, so that everyone uh, can participate, but it's also a regulatory issue, so uh, that's on, on our list to improve on that situation as well. Right, um, so final slide uh, almost. Uh, so how, how is the situation with adopters? Uh, we have had uh, about 10 companies who started uh, using the product uh, during our project. And uh, m yeah, more than five companies who are actually uh, starting to use it in their uh, products and in the field. Uh, also some uh, companies from Europe picked it up and provided really valuable uh, feedback and pull requests. We also tried to really start it from the very beginning from requirement specification towards the final design of the PCB to have everything on GitHub. So the specification was on GitHub, everyone could uh, interact uh, with us and um, yeah, we've also got a community forum. One is on the Eden Access uh, Foundation website and in the Libre Solar Foundation, uh, Libre Solar uh, forum. But uh, I usually prefer just using GitHub issues and pull requests for communication so you have it in the right place and uh, people will find it. Yeah, so if you're interested in uh, developing such systems or using them, uh, just join us on our journey to bring power to the people. And here are some resources, uh, some websites uh, where you can, uh, can find all the hardware designs, firmware designs, and the community. And now, uh, yeah, we're open to hear your questions. So first, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for your great work in the open source community. 
Um, I had a several few questions. First, uh, I saw that you had a passive balancing board uh, on your BMS, and I was wondering if you are also offering or thinking about active b balancing. Um, well, yeah, I'm yeah. Take a second as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, we really try to uh, uh, use active balancing at the very beginning and had this on our requirements list, but finally dropped it because of cost reasons. So there are some linear technologies chips and Texas Instruments chips which cost uh, five dollars each for six cells. And they are really expensive. You have lots of passive components as well that you need. Uh, so that was the main reason that we are just going with uh, passive balancing at the moment. There are some Chinese chips we couldn't get anywhere uh, from a reliable distributor and we couldn't get any data sheets and so on. So that was also not an option. If you have an idea how to implement a cheap active balancing system, let me know. <laughs> There was also already some contributors that wanted to do the active balancing. Okay. 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 Uh, did, did you already have some cases in which you had to handle the balancing between uh, lithium cell storage and other uh, uh, kind of storages such as uh, compressed air or uh, concrete, uh, concrete and fibers, or other, other storage system than uh, uh, lithium cell? Uh, no, so far it was only lithium cells of, of the different chemistries like iron, lithium iron phosphate, lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. Uh, we were in discussions with some people uh, developing uh, redox flow batteries uh, where the voltage is smaller so you could potentially monitor multiple cells uh, at once and get an average kind of. Um, but yeah, no, so far uh, these technologies you mentioned we haven't tried. But if the voltage range matches, then it should also be possible to do the monitoring at least for those cells. I have a couple of questions. I don't know if I can ask a multiple question or just one. Okay. 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 Um, you talk about uh, network and uh, notably um, having GSM, uh, but you don't talk about the security feature uh, for software and remote control. So I don't know, uh, is there any, how is it handled or anything? Uh, yeah, so the uh, we are using TLS certificates for the communications uh, and currently, uh, yeah, uh, that one of the problems with the uh, uh, problems with security <laughs> is that uh, with TLS you have the handshake mechanism every time you uh, restart uh, sending something out via the modem and uh, in these areas you usually have uh, uh, SIM cards uh, with uh, roaming and they are rather expensive for high data rates, so you have uh, like six megabytes per month only, and if you do a TLS handshake every time, uh, then that gets tricky, so you have to reduce your data rate. We also thought about other things like co-op, where you don't have the handshake, uh, but it's, it's tricky, but we're still implementing security, so we're not making any compromises on that. Uh, thanks. Originally it was the same question as the first one, uh, but I can switch to the next one. Um, do you, did you consider to have a bit more modularity like on the other models you had? Uh, those were somehow split up because on a bicycle, for example, 36 volts, I wouldn't need 100 amps. Uh, so <laughs> that would be a bit much. And uh, I think for everyone afterwards, uh, I'll, we'll come out together and uh, we could chat about the uh, Videotech project uh, Ontech mentioned. Uh, yeah, so you have a certain degree of modularity which you can uh, implement through uh, leaving out some components. So you could just uh, have less MOSFETs or take uh, cheaper and smaller connectors and then uh, reduce the, cur the current. That's possible in that direction but not in the other direction. So we uh, designed it for 100 amps which is almost the limit of what you can get with the uh, power and uh, control PCB on the same uh, control part on the same PCB because the chips have small pin pitches and if you need a huge copper then you get into trouble with that. So, yeah. 
and as you mentioned, the bicycle. So this is really designed for energy access, as we said, and like for like high power appliances in energy access, so like milling machines or stuff like, or a tricycle, where actually then you possibly get to the 100 amps that you, you will need, and not for like an e-bike, like one person e-bike. We have 13 seconds. Yeah. It's precise. <coughs> I'll be quick. Um, so, uh, uh, as far as I know, there isn't a standard protocol for talking to BMSs from all, you know, because you're going to be talking to standard inverters in a typical system, assuming there's some solar input, and the problem is that most of those aren't open yet. So uh, they expect that there's a whole series of battery protocols. And so currently, if you buy a, a generic inverter, it speaks 15 different battery impersonation modes. I'm just wondering what you've, if you've done some of that or if anybody's thinking of a sensible standard for this madness. Five second answer. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, uh, we thought about that, but uh, that's all only software. So the ideas that, that we have are RS485 and uh, um, CAN bus, so you can implement uh, any special kind of battery protocol. Uh, we have CAN open uh, ready made out of uh, Zephyr, so that's already something, uh, yeah, a higher level complicated stack that's already pre built in. But um, yeah, anything, any very special thing would have to be implemented. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And I think